The scripture for the third Sunday of Advent comes from Matthew, our first gospel, the first chapter of that gospel. It is, of course, the story of Christ being born. It's important today to you to listen to this story as we flesh it out in our worship experience. As Simon comes to preach, we're going to particularly ask you to focus on the role of Joseph and what Joseph does in this story because it is incredibly important to the incarnation of Christ. Here are these, the words of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother marriage was, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. May we put our hearts together as we pray. O oh Lord God, during this holy season, we celebrate the child who comes who comes to provide much for us. We celebrate that his earthly father said yes to you. Yes to honoring your eternal way and with Mary, becoming the humans selected to guide Jesus, Emmanuel, to adulthood. Of him the prophets say he will be called Wonderful Counselor because his very presence will reassure our souls. Whether it is at Christmas or time or some other moment when our lives are disrupted by brokenness or grief or upsetting feelings or sadness or calamity or a world pandemic, the God who is with us, Emmanuel, will counsel our hearts and bring wholeness to us. The prophet says that he will be our mighty God, and we need a mighty God. Our lives, finite and frail, are useful and worthy only when viewed in the perspective that we are children of a mighty God who controls and cares about our every aspect in creation. While in this season we may commemorate your coming in the form of a baby, you of course never intended for us to see you only as a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Throughout scripture and the world around us today, it is the strong name of Jesus who did not remain a child, but became Lord, at which every knee shall bow and tongue confess. For you are a mighty God, and we need a mighty God to lead our lives. The prophets say that Emmanuel, God with us, who comes shall also be known as the everlasting Father. We cherish this holy parenting, dear God. If all else fails, if every human relationship we have crumbles, there you are your arms of grace and mercy reaching to us. You hold us in the palm of your hands with love and kindness. You are the Prince of Peace. Every day, Lord, we pray that not another man, woman, or child will be harmed by acts of war yet every single day in many places across this world. Men, women, and children die in unholy warfare. Help us resolve the things in our hearts that make us feel as people and nations and even as religious bodies that we need to fight to make our point. Prince of Peace, deliver us. Deliver us from even ourselves. That your reign might happen here on earth as it is in heaven. This holy God with us, Emmanuel, is our prayer as we stand at the edge of this moment. We plead with you, dear Lord, that your servant Simon who has immersed himself in this teaching might preach your word with authority, the authority granted by you this day. Humble his spirit that your word might come to life in the words we hear from him today. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Simon Campbell. I'm the Director of Worship and Mission here at Marion Methodist, and we are continuing. We're in the middle of our sermon series called Christmas, Our Hope in Crisis, and we titled it that because of the world that we're living in now. Our lives have been full of crisis and chaos this year. We all know that. We've been living in it. I, I don't need to recount it all, all that's happened, but it I think we can relate to the fact that it's been hard to make decisions this year. It's been hard to know what to do, who to listen to, how to face the chaos we're in. And like many of you, I am so looking forward to Christmas this year. We're looking forward to reliving, to remembering Jesus' coming at Christmas when the hope of the whole world came to save us. And it's getting closer, right? We can feel it. When we look around, we see the familiar signs of the season. We see the lights in the city and on people's homes. We hear Christmas music on the radio. We have Christmas treats filling our home. And, of course, all the awesome Christmas movies, right? And I'm not talking about the Hallmark ones. I'm talking about, like, the classics, right, that we watch over and over again. But, I mean, now that I think about it, Aren't all Hallmark, Hallmark movies like the same movie, just like redone with different people? So I guess it sort of works that way. You're, we're watching those movies over and over again. They become so familiar to us. But I think sometimes things, that, things become so familiar, we don't expect anything new from them anymore. And I think that's what happens to us you know we we wa love watching these christmas movies over and over again and um, one of my wife's favorites by the way is uh tim allen's uh, the santa claus right and i remember watching this a few times when i was a kid but this is one of laura's all-time favorite movies like watch a christmas movie in july kind of favorite movie and when i married laura I got a lot of more, um, a lot more opportunity to become familiar with this movie. <laughs> and uh, when I watched it as a kid, I guess I, I never recognized the play on words, you know, the, the Santa Claus with the E at the end. Um, I just thought it was like a fancy spelling of it, right? And as, a, but as an adult, when I, when I watched this movie, I realized that they meant like the legal clause as like a contract so that when Tim Allen puts on the, the coat of Santa Claus, he contractually becomes obligated to be the next Santa. This changes the, the way you see the movie <laughs> and, and realizes like a deeper level of meaning. And something, sim something similar happened to me when I was looking at Joseph in the Christmas story getting ready for today. There's a detail buried in here about him that completely changed the way I see this part of the story. You see, Jos the story of Joseph is so familiar. It's so familiar to us. We don't expect something new. You know, we've heard it a whole over and over. You know, Mary and Joseph were engaged. Mary's miraculously pregnant. And, but an angel, you know, comes and, and tells Joseph, yeah, it's all cool. You can, you can marry her. Um, so Joseph marries Mary, and they have a baby, and they name him Jesus. And Jesus becomes the Savior of all mankind. And the point of the story is that Joseph... Is, had the faith to do what God asked him to do because he knew all this cool stuff was going to happen and he was happy to do it, right? That's it. Well, not exactly. When we look a little closer, when we look a little closer at Joseph, there's a lot more crisis and chaos in his life than we often think. And looking deeper at the story of Joseph can help us navigate the chaos around us and hold on to the hope that Christmas offers us. Now the first way that the story of Joseph can help us navigate chaos and hold on to hope in our lives is, is recognizing that our chaos can threaten to compromise the reach of God's blessings in our lives. Our chaos can threaten to compromise the reach of God's blessings in our lives. Being asked to raise the Son of God as your own is an amazing blessing. But it also caused a lot of chaos in Joseph's life. 
You see, when Mary was found to be pregnant before, this was, before she and Joseph were married, this was a major crisis for both of them. Ancient betrothal or engagement was way different from what we think of when we think of engagement. It was, uh, th this betrothal was like a binding clause, like the Santa Claus and Tim Allen and the coat. It was a contract. Um, it was arranged initially by the bride's father. This marriage, this contract was, was arranged by him, and the bride would come with a dowry, which was a reflection of the bridal family's wealth to contribute to the marriage. The groom would pay a bride price, a gift to the bride's father as a way to kind of seal the deal. And at this point, once this contract is in place, legally this couple is considered married. And to the point this, that they would be required to divorce, to dissolve the betrothal. It, which is very different from our engagement. You just break up, there's no legal or economic things that have to happen. But here there were. In fact, if Joseph as the groom had died prior to the wedding ceremony, Mary would have been considered a widow. So when, when, this presu so when Mary was found to be a pregnant, the obvious conclusion was that she was somehow unfaithful to Joseph, and this unfaithfulness in engagement is considered adultery. This would have been seen as betrayal and dishonor of the worst kind in this culture. And under Jewish law, it was permitted that this was punishable by death. And at the very least, there would be severe humiliation, sometimes publicly. This drastically impacted, this would have drastically impacted Mary's, the shamed bride's prospects of ever marrying. And there would be massive economic impact for the rest of the bride's life because marriage was the only way that women could socially elevate themselves at this time. Make no mistake, the miraculous conception of Jesus was a crisis for Mary and Joseph. And Joseph was faced with a big decision about how to handle this. Now, the social expectations on Joseph, everybody would have expected him that, that, to divorce Mary, like to just distance himself as much as possible from this pregnancy. It wasn't really an option at all for him to, like, give her a second chance. Because both Jewish and Roman law demanded that a man divorce his, his wife if she were guilty of adultery in this situation. Roman law actually treated a husband who failed to divorce his wife in this situation as a panderer or a pimp exploiting his wife as a prostitute. If Joseph had let the chaos of this situation and the weight of all of these expectations on him overwhelm his desire to be faithful, this could absolutely have compromised the reach of the blessing that God was trying to bring into his life. Now, I want to be clear about something. Joseph did not have the power to prevent Jesus' coming into the world, but he could have easily avoided the role God wanted him to play in this story. And it's the same thing with us. It's absolutely the same thing with us. The chaos in our lives can't derail the ultimate, like the promises and the, and the end, end game, the plan of God, but it can remove us from our part that God wants us to play in it. So like in the Santa Claus, you know, Scott Calvin, he didn't have to be Santa. Like, he could have chosen not to believe it and break the clause, and someone else would be Santa. But he would miss out on bringing joy and Christmas spirit to children all over the world, right? So the lesson that we learn from Joseph's story is that even though our chaos can threaten to compromise the reach of God's blessings into our lives, we can't, he, Joseph teaches us, don't ever let the chaos of your crisis cause you to lose hold of the hope that God promises you. Don't ever let the chaos of your crisis make you lose hold of the hope God promises you. The second way that jo Joseph's story helps us is this. Being faithful 
often goes beyond what seems right. Being faithful, especially in crisis, often goes beyond what seems right. Joseph was fully in his rights to divorce Mary. In fact, he, you know, everybody would have seen this as the right thing to do for Joseph. And he could have taken it even a couple steps further. He could have sought economic retribution or compensation for this kind of disaster that he was in. He could have gone and had the, the bride price that he paid Mary's father refunded to him. He, he could have taken Mary to court even and still be able to claim her dowry from, from Mary's father. He could have publicly humiliated her, but he planned to divorce her quietly with two or three witnesses, which would have totally put aside any chance at, at being compensated for this. And, he, and here's the thing, uh, you know, Mary and Joseph probably didn't know each other super well. You know, betrothed in this ancient betrothal, they were not allowed to spend time alone with each other for reasons like what we're, what we're seeing. And so they wouldn't have known each other. This wasn't like a romantic connection. So Joseph wasn't like for his feelings for Mary kind of putting this aside. This was a business deal. It was a contract. His initial thought to divorce her quietly seemed like a good option. But God had a plan for the best. Seemed like a good option. But God had a plan for the best. Instead, against all common sense and, and conventional wisdom, Joseph chooses to listen to the angel in his dream and remain in his betrothal contract to Mary. Now, I can imagine it would be hard for him to explain his reasoning about this. You know, yeah, I was going to divorce her like you all expect me to, but then I had an angel tell me not to in a dream. I mean, really, like, how reliable are your dreams? If you tried to convince somebody of, of something that you dreamed in the last couple of weeks that it was real and you're going to make this huge life decision on it, people would be kind of like, mm. And, in fact, it, this kind of makes me think of the Santa Claus. You know, he, Scott Calvin had thought that he dreamed that he went to the North Pole with his son Charlie and actually had a hard time explaining his sudden weight gain, his fast-growing facial hair, and all these children lining up to see him wherever he went. Man, I've got that movie stuck in my head. It's almost like I've seen it three times this month. <laughs> and I loved every single time of it. Love you, honey. In choosing to stay betrothed to Mary, in choosing to stay betrothed to Mary, people would assume that Joseph had fathered the child before the marriage ceremony. That's what they would have thought by by choosing to, to stay in this contract, people would assume that Joseph was also guilty in this situation. And being guilty of premarital sex would bring enduring shame on Joseph and his family. This reputation would follow Mary, Joseph, and Jesus for the rest of their life. You see, Nazareth was a small town, and even the ancient small towns are not that different from small towns today. Everybody knows everybody's business, right? I mean, I'm from a small town. I know how this works. When, um, when I was in seventh grade, a group of friends and I decided that we were going to perform uh, the song Sweet Home Alabama. And all my, you know, my friends, you know, one of them decided, oh yeah, I'm going to play air guitar. And the other ones, oh, I'm going to play air drums. But no, I, I decided that no, I'm going to actually sing to Sweet Home Alabama to the backing track. And, you know, in my head when we did it, oh, it sounded awesome. It was great. In reality, <clears throat> It sounded like a kid going through puberty whose voice was nowhere near being settled. Okay, and this performance, right, earned me the nickname Bama. And there are still those in Osage, I think if I, you know, went back and saw them, that they'd still be calling me Bama 15 years later. Joseph knew. Joseph knew how this worked. He knew that in choosing to stay betrothed to Mary, he would be humiliated he would be shamed and condemned even though he did, had done nothing wrong and it was going to follow him. But here's, here's what we learn from Joseph. Being faithful 
often be, goes beyond what seems right, especially in crisis. So don't let the chaos of your crisis force you to choose what seems right when God promises what is best. Don't let the chaos of your crisis force you to choose what seems right when God promises what is best. And last, Joseph, the story of Joseph teaches us remaining faithful in chaos allows us to see and experience God's blessing. There's a little detail that finishes out our passage this morning. It says, and he, meaning Joseph, gave him the name Jesus. And at first when we read this, like, okay, Captain Obvious, uh, that's what God told Joseph to do. Duh. But there's a reason. There's a reason that Joseph naming Jesus is commanded by God. And that it is explicitly mentioned again at the end of the passage. This, this is the little detail that shifted the way that I see Joseph's story. This is the E at the end of Santa Claus. This, so this, is, this kind of blew my mind. Let me, let me go through this. Throughout the Old Testament, there are many promises that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. That he would restore the kingdom of Israel and save the people of God from their oppressors. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 through 6, we see this promise declared. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord of Righteous Savior. We see that this promise of this king that will descend from David to, to, uh, to bring safety to the land of Israel and to, and to have victory over their oppressors, this promise is echoed when the angel visits Mary in Luke chapter 1. The angel says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. But here's the catch, though. Mary was not a descendant of David. Joseph was. But Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, so how is Jesus descended from David. Here it comes. In the Jewish culture, naming a child was an important role of the child's father. When they named the child, the father was confirming and claiming the child as his own and that this child was entitled as a legitimate heir of his household. This was Joseph's last chance to kind of distance himself, to, to preserve himself a little bit from the chaos of the crisis he was in. You see, if he had refused to name Jesus, and, and it would sort of deny Jesus as his heir, and it was the last point at which J Joseph could have maybe taken another way and avoided some public disgrace. But in the face of all the chaos of this crisis he was in, Joseph chose to be faithful to the role that God had called him to. When Joseph named Jesus, he claimed Jesus as his own and adopted Jesus into the lineage of King David. Joseph was not overwhelmed by the chaos of this crisis. He took on the humiliation, the shame, and condemnation of Jesus' birth and adopted him into the line of kingship. He did not let the chaos of his crisis made, make him lose hold of the hope that God promised him. He did not let the chaos of his crisis force him to choose what seemed right when God promised what was best. He did not let the chaos of his crisis keep him from being faithful to what God's plan for his life was. The moment that Joseph named 
Jesus, he accepted knowingly. He accepted the humiliation, shame, and guilt that others would place on him even though he never did anything wrong. The moment Joseph named Jesus, he knew the sacrifice he was making. He knew the cost and was willing to pay it. The moment that Joseph named Jesus, he knew that it would be the death of his reputation, but he did not let the chaos of his crisis keep him from being faithful to God's plan for his life. Because the moment that Joseph named Jesus, Jesus. He adopted Jesus into the line of David and fulfilled the promises of God to his people and established the king of kings who would rule forever and ever. The moment that Joseph named Jesus, that was the moment that Joseph stopped being an ordinary carpenter. He became a precursor of the king of kings. He became a reflection of who the the man that his son was going to be. He became a hint leading to the truth that would one day set all men free. He became a shadow of the light of the world that would purge darkness forever. He became a whisper that would grow into the cry, it is finished, and destroy the power of sin and death forever. Because there would be a moment when Jesus would choose to accept our humiliation, our shame, and our guilt, even though he had never done anything wrong. There would be a moment when Jesus would choose to become the sacrifice for our sins and pay the cost we could not. There would be a moment when Jesus would choose to die for our sake. He did not let the chaos of his crisis keep him from being faithful to God's plan for the world. He did not let the chaos of our crisis keep him from being faithful to God's plan for the world. Jesus did all of this so there could be that moment when Jesus calls us by name and adopts us as heirs into his heavenly kingdom to enjoy paradise with him forever. So no matter what chaos or crisis comes our way, hold on to that hope that God promises you at Christmas. Don't settle for what seems right when God calls you to what is best. And stay faithful to the role that God has called you to play because he wants you to see and experience the blessings of his glorious kingdom forever. And if we do that, If we can do that, we will stop being ordinary people. We will stop being ordinary people when we will become glimpses. We will become visions of our Savior, Jesus Christ, walking around in the world among us. And when people see us, they'll get a glimpse, they'll get a chance to see Jesus and perhaps be able to welcome the hope that he offers into their lives and begin a relationship with him to take a hold of that hope that starts at Christmas. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope that you offer us at Christmas. And Lord, we pray that the chaos of our crisis would not overwhelm us from being faithful to the call that you have placed on our lives that we would take hold of the opportunity to see who you are calling us to be so that we might become that glimpse. That we would not exchange what seems right for what you plan is best. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us us to embody the teachings of your son, Jesus Christ, that when people look at us, they might see you. And when they see you, they might come and hear you call in their name so that they might be sons and daughters of the King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.